Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of the day it is that you're joining us. This is the Tulsa World Scene podcast with the pod people of the Tulsa World Scene Department. I'm joined here by my colleagues, uh, Grace Wood and Jimmy Trammell. And we are talking about some of the things that we have um, occupied our time with over the past week that we'll be sharing in future is issues of the Tulsa World available online at tulsaworld.com and at fine convenience stores everywhere. Um, we were talking a little bit about this before we started, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the generation of Tulsa public school students where shop was mandatory. Um, the women, the, the girls, the female students, whatever is the proper phrase these days, um, had to take uh, home economics and the boys had to take a semester of woodworking and a semester of metalworking. And the fact that most people came out with all uh, fingers intact um, was probably a, a miracle on the order of parting the Red Sea. But <laughs> there are people that have gone on beyond high school shop class. And I think, Grace, you, uh, spent uh, an informative afternoon or two with some of them. I sure did. Yeah. Um, my story this week is just about woodworking and how the hobby has really grown so much over the past few years. Um, I spoke to a few woodworking hobbyists and experts who um, spoke a lot about how the rise of social media platforms like YouTube and TikTok have really just expose people to the world of woodworking uh, because there are so many creators on those platforms who show off their woodworking skills and share their knowledge for how to do it. Um, so that combined with the pandemic and just people needing to spend more time in their homes has just led a lot of folks to take up woodworking for the first time, um, especially young people who are looking to learn a new hobby or skill. Um, and I actually paid a visit to a local woodworker named Bob Block, and he showed me his workshop and some really incredible carvings he's made of animals like eagles and dragons and wooden sculptures he's made of different people and he even showed me a carving he made of a maple leaf that was like so realistic and like paper thin it was really amazing and he just talked a lot about how he and other woodworking enthusiasts in Tulsa are just you know trying to promote and teach the hobby to younger generations so that it can just continue to grow um so it was really interesting to hear from him but um one of our photographers, Manuela, took some really amazing photos of Bob's creations. Um, so make sure to go check out my article and her pictures in this Saturday's Tulsa World. Now, this is different from wood turning, right? I mean, I know I know some uh, artists uh, will do that where they'll, you know, cart, put something on a you know, big block of wood on a lathe and slowly, you know, shape it as it, as it spins. But this is a different sort of sort of creature, correct? Um, yeah, Bob does more of the like hand carving, but I spoke to experts at Woodcraft, which is like, you know, the Mecca for all things woodworking in Tulsa, and they have all kinds of woodworking and wood turning, you know, materials and, um, and tools there that people can use and hand saws and table saws and all that stuff. So they were kind of able to speak to the more, um, to the different kinds of woodworking, because there's really so many. <laughs> Are you are 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 you are, are you someone that has worked with wood in the past, uh, Jimmy? I've read a lot of Woody Woodpecker comics. I mean, that's <laughs> pretty much the extent of it. I, 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 I've dealt with some people that I thought might have been made of wood, but uh, yeah. Mm. I, um, my late wife referred to me as being mechanically declined. So uh, <laughs> declined. Oh my I was, god! I was I was I was kept away from 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 sharp objects and implements of destruction in my in in, in my time but um anyway um moving moving on uh, uh destruction comes to mind so um the uh, uh dallas-based group called the turtle creek corral uh it is uh the most reported male coral ensemble in the world uh, will be coming to Tulsa. They they visited here in the past on uh, Saturday uh, to perform a, a program called uh, uh, "Let Us March On," 
And uh, one of the pieces that they're doing is a special uh, commission uh, that is centered around the the Tulsa race massacre, although it's not really about that. It's more of a celebration of uh, what had been built up there in Greenwood prior to um, prior to the destruction. And um, the uh, libretto is based on, if you can see this, um, Mary uh, Jones Parrish's uh, memoir of the the days leading up to and and, and at the aftermath of the Tulsa race massacre, and uh, it's a uh, the, the person who wrote the libretto is uh, black. The composer is black, um, and uh, the way they're going to stage it is going to be um, a little interesting because. Um, it's a diverse cast uh, chorus, but there's obviously very fewer black singers than there are white singers, and they're going to be set up so that they are almost, in a way, in opposition, and then ultimately come together at the end. So that'll be um, Saturday night. Is it Trinity uh, Episcopal? Uh, Tickets are available at turtlecreekcorral.com, I believe. So uh, check that out. We'll have an interview with the uh, conductor of the chorus, who is a native of Sand Springs. So um, he brings a, he brings a unique perspective uh, to this. Another unique perspective is provided by a friend of Blake Sheldon, who I believe that you talked with, uh, Jimmy. Yeah, I got word that someone had written a book about Blake Shelton, and it was not written by Blake Shelton. So you start to worry, like, gee, is it one of those uh, unauthorized biographies that he's going to be angry about? Or if it was written by Miranda Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> then you find out this one was written by someone who has known him since he was 12 years old and actually helped him move to Nashville at the start of his career when he was 17 years old. He actually went to this family, the author and her family, when he was uh, a sophomore, junior in high school and says, can you help me go to Nashville? And they said, we'll make you a deal. Finish high school, then we'll take care of this other thing in Nashville. So he finished school in Ada. Uh, they help him move to Nashville. And, and you can read about every step along the way in this new book by Carol Cash Large, who has a 2 p.m. book signing Saturday, Barnes & Noble, at the uh, Woodland Plaza location, which is on 71st, across from Woodland Hills Mall. Okay. Is it, 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 is it, I guess it's, it's not necessarily full of juicy tidbits, or have you had a chance yeah. to go through all through it? Closely? The author told me that she definitely stayed away from National Enquirer territory. It's not uh, delving into his personal life, but it does delve... Uh, uh, she's someone who feels like songwriters should get credit, so she'd make sure to give credit to all the writers of the songs that uh, Blake Shelton has turned into his many hits over the years. Excellent. That's that 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 is that is that is a good thing. So, um, I don't. Uh, there, there was <clears throat> an article. Um, let's see, I think it ran Sunday in the in the New York Times about. Um, Korean-born uh, she chefs who were, as children, adopted by American parents and are now uh, kind of trying to reconnect with um, a heritage that, you know, they know only at a remove, probably. Um, and uh, by the sheerest coincidence, uh, our upcoming uh, food review is going to be of Mr. Kim's Asian Steakhouse, um, which is a uh, concept by uh, the McNelly Group um, that is the creation of their director of culinary operations, Ben Alexander, who himself is um, a native of Korea who was adopted by an American family. And um, his, um, his family, uh, tried to, as best they could, create, you know, Korean dishes for 
for him and I believe it's two sisters. I know there I know there were other siblings that that were part of the family. And uh, so this this restaurant is kind of an homage to that because it brings in all kinds of different Asian um, flavors, but it has a very Korean forward approach. Um, it is a uh, kind of a cook it yourself place. They will if each table has a round uh, gas grill in the middle of it. And uh, they bring out, we, we took advantage of the tasting menu and they brought out an array of side dishes and five different kinds of meat that we were grilling. And it's very, very good. And we're going to have that uh, coming up uh, probably next uh, uh, next week in, in, in the Tulsa world for so look for that. Another I, thing, I have a question before before we get off food. Okay. I'm curious and I'm fascinated by the food thing that you do. Uh, how soon in a trip to a restaurant, what's your tip early on that this is going to be a good experience or a bad experience? Is there a tell early on that you know this is going to be good or this is going to be bad? Ah, uh, that's it. That's I'll put it this way. I the short answer is no. Um because um so many tiny little things can go wrong and so many tiny little things can surprise you hmm. that um I um and may, may, maybe I, I I go in with a slightly different attitude. I I I I, <clears throat> I don't know. But whenever I go to review anything, uh, I'm wanting to enjoy it. You know, if I go to a some sort of performance, you know, I'm hoping they put on a good show. Um, and uh, it's usually easier to tell in a show when. Uh, when it's going to be bad, but, uh, but with a restaurant, I mean, th there was one restaurant that I remember going through a very long meal thinking that everything was great. Everything was great. Everything was great. And then one side dish was just so horribly bad. <laughs> I mean, it was sort of like, what were they thinking kind of a thing. Hmm. And uh, so, I mean, so that can happen. And then you could go into a place where you think this is, the crummiest looking dive you you can imagine. Yeah. And out of the kitchen comes something really special. So hmm. no, it, it 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 it's 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 best to go with with, with an open mind and uh and, and an open mouth. And an open mouth <laughs> and empty stomach as as they say on Iron Chef. So mm -hmm. so that's what uh okay that, that that I hope I hope that I hope that you find that an interesting answer to your question. Well, we were going to talk about things that we were anticipating, and one of them is the the new season of Reservation Dogs, which drops this today. Well, today we're, we're, we're doing this that. Wednesday, so it's it drops today. Uh, are, are they doing the? Are, are they dropping the entire series, or are they the first two episodes? Out? Okay, drop today, and then uh, from then on, it'll be a you know one a week type situation. I've cheated, you know. I, I played the uh, the press card. And I've watched the first four episodes, and I can tell you right away that uh, Reservation Dogs is not was not a one hit wonder. Uh, it really continues to be uh, different than anything else you've seen on TV. I know it's called a comedy, uh, but uh, as we get deeper into season two, the viewers will see that uh, uh, some very emotional, serious moments. Uh, if you don't get moist eyes at the end of of us, uh, the fourth episode, maybe something's wrong with you. Uh, but but it's also it's not so much dark. It's also uplifting, and I would encourage anyone who has not watched this yet, Reservation Dogs, to uh, to jump on the bandwagon right now. Is it, 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 is it worth subscribing to the to to the service on which it streams? It streams on FX on Hulu. And uh, I never see the bills, so I'll just say yes. You know, someone okay. else in the family pays the bills. So, sure, yeah. You know, get give me five of them. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. 
do 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 you all uh, subscribe to a lot of streaming services or 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 or, or, or do you, do you get uh, your TV the old fashioned way, Grace? <laughs> Um, I'm at this point in my life where I'm an adult, but not really like fully an adult yet. And I'm still on like my parents' streaming services for pretty much everything. So I have their HBO and Netflix and Hulu that I still get to use. I don't know how much longer that's going to last. I think I'm just going to like not bring it up to them <laughs> and wait for them to notice that I'm still using all that stuff. So. Just make sure they don't hear this, hear this recording, you know. <laughs> I, I think Mom, we, the next week, don't listen to it. <laughs> I think we have a ton of streaming services, but I don't, I stay out of it. I just let my daughter pick them all. And then, you know, I'll watch, you know, whatever comes over the old antenna, you know, me TV or whatever else, and then catch streaming when I need to. Uh, and also I got, I have, uh, still set up where I can record things on a DVR because we're required to watch things for our job and you don't want to miss them. So sure. Yeah. I, 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 I have, um, a satellite set up and, um, uh, I think I, Netflix, Netflix and, and, and Amazon. And the only reason I have Amazon is because, my uh, my late wife subscribed to Prime, and I just haven't stopped. So, uh, but in all honesty, it's it's so rare that you know I get the chance to watch TV that uh, subscribing to a, a bunch of things would would probably be uh, fool foolish. Either that, or I would accomplish nothing because I just sit in front of the TV watching. Um, British detective stories for 24 hours. But anyway, that's <laughs> just me. Well, I believe that uh, <clears throat> covers the, the the waterfront that we have, unless uh, Jimmy or Grace have uh, some final words of wisdom they want to share. Plateau Barada Nikto, you know, that's that's it. Uh, yeah, nothing for me. <laughs> other, than, uh, other than the need to now look up what Jimmy just said, so you'll know uh, what we're talking about. Well, <laughs> Um, that wraps it up for um, this particular um, um, podcast. Uh, thanks always to uh, Grace and Jimmy for taking part in this. And uh, we wish you all the best and good luck, Miss Ellerbach, wherever you are. Behave. Bye.